Hi, my name is Grant Kramer and I'm a professor emeritus at the University of Nevada, Reno. Today we'll be continuing my plant physiology series, lecture seven on photosynthesis, in particular about the light reactions. Have you ever wondered why leaves are green? These green leaves are all green because they're photosynthesizing and it's the chlorophyll molecule that is green that is responsible for this photosynthetic reaction. Now photosynthesis has the biggest impact on life on earth. It captures the energy from the sun and it converts it into carbohydrates which then get converted into energy. The light reactions are about some of that capture of the energy and the production of that into chemical energy from light energy. In addition to fixing CO2, it also produces oxygen, which is necessary for life on this planet for most of our organisms, including us. The carbon reactions, which we'll cover in the next lecture, will deal with the carbohydrates that are produced from that, that we all enjoy as sugars, for example. Lecture seven, the light reactions of photosynthesis. We can distill photosynthesis into two phases, the light phase and the carbon phase, formerly called the dark phase. In the light phase, the most important reactions are the conversion of ADP into ATP. This is the conversion of the energy captured through photosynthesis into this energy-rich molecule called ATP. It also converts NADP to NADPH, another energy molecule. In the carbon reactions, we have the process of CO2 being captured from the atmosphere and utilizing the ATP and the NADPH produced in the light reactions to convert and capture that energy into carbohydrates, in particular sugars. All of these reactions take place in the chloroplast. So let's look at the chloroplast structure as it is critical to how energy is captured and processed. So we have a chloroplast, which is a organelle within the cytoplasm of the cell. The membranes in the chloroplast are very important in creating compartments within the chloroplast. So let's start with the outer envelope first, which then has an inner membrane or inner envelope inside of it. And between that is known as the intermembrane space. Inside the inner envelope is an area called the stroma. And within the stroma is another membrane system known as the thylakoid membranes. The thylakoid membranes are an integrated system of complicated structure. And the stacks of these thylakoid membranes are known as the grana. And interconnecting the grana are the stroma lamellae, making for a complicated thylakoid membrane system. So within the thylakoid itself, we have a thylakoid lumen. So there's an interior in the thylakoid membranes. Much of the photosynthetic enzymes or proteins that are involved in electron transport are embedded in the thylakoid membranes. And many of the enzymes involved in the carbon reactions are located in the stroma. Here's an actual transmission electron micrograph of a chloroplast showing you the structure of the chloroplast. So we can see the thylakoid membranes that are tightly stacked, surrounded by the stroma, which is then surrounded by the outer and inner membranes. Note that the outer and inner membranes are very close to each other. There's very little space there so that it looks like a single membrane. So in this next section, we're going to understand the light reactions. And to do that first, we have to understand light itself. Light has both particle and wave characteristics, as we have known from physics. A wave is characterized by a wavelength. 
denoted by the Greek letter lambda, which is the distance between successive wave crests. The frequency, which is represented by the Greek letter nu, is the number of wave crests that pass an observer in a given time. This light wave is a transverse electromagnetic wave, which has both electric and magnetic field components to it that oscillate perpendicular to the direction of the propagation of the wave. Light is also a particle, which we call a photon. Each photon contains a packet of energy called a quantum. This energy content is not continuous. The energy of a photon depends on the frequency of light, according to Planck's law. So sunlight is like a rain of photons of different frequencies. Our eyes are only sensitive to a smaller range of these frequencies, as seen here. So here we have a graph of the electromagnetic spectrum. And you can see from the physical spectrum that we fall between 400 and 700 nanometers. 400 is in the violet range and 700 is in the red range. Short wavelengths of high frequency light has a high energy content. Long wavelengths or low frequency light has a lower energy content. We can measure the wavelengths of light using a spectrophotometer. And this is a basic concept of a spectrophotometer where a light with various wavelengths is shown through a prism, and that prism can separate the light into various individual wavelengths, which is then shown through a sample, and light will pass through that sample as transmitted light and be detected by a photo detector. And you can then plot that on a computer to see how the wavelengths are being transmitted or more appropriately absorbed by the sample. Those wavelengths that are not transmitted are absorbed. And you can make an absorption spectrum of a sample. In biochemistry, then we can use this spectrophotometer to identify molecules that are in our sample. And in this way, for example, we can look at chlorophyll the pigment that absorbs sunlight in leaves. Chlorophyll is what makes the leaves look green. If we look on the right-hand side, we can see an absorption spectrum of chlorophyll. And here we can see on the vertical axis, the range of wavelengths from 400 to just above 700 in the visible range. And we can see that what is wavelengths are being absorbed are in the blue region and in the red region. Very little is absorbed in the green region. And this is why the object or leaf or chlorophyll looks green because it's simply reflecting or transmitting that wavelength of light. So when we see a color, it's because the color is being transmitted or reflected off of that object. In this case, we can't see the blue and the red because they're simply being absorbed by the chlorophyll molecule. On the left-hand side of this figure, we can see what is actually going on with a chlorophyll molecule. As it absorbs the energy of blue light, it can raise an electron from the ground state, which is known as the lowest energy state, up to a very higher excited state. So that electronic energy has now been captured th through that blue wavelength. Now, that energy can be dissipated as a heat loss, which will then lower that electron to a lower orbital, to a lower excited state, which coincidentally is where a red light would excite it too. So red light has less energy than blue light, and therefore it can't kick that electron into an uh, outer orbital of higher energy state. So that energy could be lost as heat, or it may be also lost as fluorescence as shown 
at the lower excited state where fluorescence is the emission of light at a slightly longer wavelength, releasing that energy and returning that electron back to its normal state. Now, when the electron is in the higher excited state, it's in a very unstable condition and it immediately loses some of that energy to heat. In this lowest excited state, the electron can stay there for a maximum of several nanoseconds. Because of this high instability of the electronic states, anything that is going to capture the energy from the state must happen very rapidly. Another way that energy can be transferred is from the chlorophyll molecule to another molecule. This is passed along at this lower excited state to another chlorophyll molecule, for example. And in addition, in a fourth process, photochemistry can occur, which is where the energy of the excited state causes chemical reactions to occur. This is what a chlorophyll molecule looks like. On the left hand side, we see chlorophyll A, which is slightly different from chlorophyll B, as you see in the right, where a methyl group is changed to a CHO, as shown here in this figure. And in a bacterial chlorophyll A, which is not in plants, but is present in some bacteria, that you can see that the structures are slightly different again. The chlorophyll molecule has a porphyrin-like ring structure that coordinates a magnesium ion in the center of this structure. And it has a long hydrophobic hydrocarbon tail that anchors this photosynthetic structure in the membrane. Now it is the double bonds in this porphyrin structure that are important for the absorption of light and the capture of energy. In addition to chlorophyll pigments to capture light, an additional important pigment in the chloroplast is a pigment known as the carotenoids, a structure here that we can see known as beta carotene. Carotenoids absorb light in a different region of the visible spectrum between 400 and 500 nanometers. This 400 to 500 nanometer range is in the green region where chlorophyll does not absorb much light. Here we can see the absorption spectra of a number of photosynthetic pigments. If we look at the purple line here, this represents chlorophyll A. And you can see that it has peak just above 400 nanometers and then it steeply drops around 460 nanometers down to near zero. In the same area, you can see beta carotene as the dark brown line that's just increasing at 400 and peaking just after 500 and then down low again at 600. If we follow the chlorophyll A out further, we see that there is another hump around 600 nanometers, peaking at 680 nanometers before it drops off again on the red side of the spectra. And then we can see other molecules here. There's a chlorophyll B and a chlorophyll D and the bacterial chlorophyll A, which is all having different wavelength absorption spectra that are different from each molecule. So in this way, we can identify the molecule using photospectrophotometers, but also we can understand how the light from the sun is more fully captured by the variety of different pigments that are out there. Now, in addition to an absorption spectrum, we have something that's called an action spectrum, and they're quite different, but they're utilized together to find meaningful information. In this case, we have the absorption spectrum of chlorophyll, which we can measure by the wavelengths that are being absorbed. That's shown here with the red spectra. The blue spectrum is known as an action spectrum. And in this case, what we do is we measure some component of photosynthesis. In this case, we know that photosynthesis produces oxygen. So you can measure the evolution of the oxygen as each wavelength of light is absorbed. 
And you can see that that evolution of oxygen follows exactly the same pattern as the absorption spectrum for chlorophyll, indicating that chlorophyll is responsible for the production of oxygen, or in this case, in the process of photosynthesis. This is direct evidence of the involvement of chlorophyll in photosynthesis. So let's discuss the concept of energy transfer during photosynthesis. So on the left-hand side, we can see light as this arrow, this is a zigzagged arrow, hitting different pigment molecules, let's say chlorophyll. And these are collected into a structure that is known as an antenna complex. That is, there are a bunch of these molecules out there that are receiving photons of light, capturing the energy from those photons. And for a moment, those molecules get very excited and they can rapidly transfer that energy to another adjacent chlorophyll molecule and ultimately pass that down to a place known as the reaction center where there is a donor providing an electron that then gets excited by this energy transfer into a higher electronic state in an acceptor molecule. And this is how energy is transferred to an electron, and the electron is transferred from a donor to an acceptor. Now let's talk for a moment a little bit about this light energy transfer. Light energy is transferred by RET, or resonance energy transfer. What is that? It's like if you took a tuning fork and you banged it, and then you put another tuning fork next to that, that vibrational energy from one tuning fork would transfer to the other tuning fork. And this way, the vibrational energy of the electrons is being transferred as a vibrational energy, resonance energy, to another molecule that then gets excited by the first molecule. And this is passed on one, one molecule to the next until it gets to the reaction center. Now, scientists or biochemists have measured these reactions very carefully. And the amount of energy in a photon is known as a quantum, so that you can measure the amount of energy or quanta by a certain reaction. So scientists have measured the quantum yield of these reactions by measuring the amount of oxygen that was produced when one flashes light at low intensity or at high intensities, or the flash energy, which is the number of photons that are being produced in that light packet. And we can see that this oxygen produced per flash increases linearly at the beginning, but then it starts to become curvilinear and level out. And this initial slope is known as the quantum yield, and it indicates to us that one oxygen molecule is produced for every nine to 10 absorbed quanta that occur. The maximum yield is one oxygen per 2,500 chlorophyll molecules. So a scientist went on to look at the quantum yield versus the absorption spectrum. And here on the left, on the y-axis, you can see the quantum yield of photosynthesis. And on the x-axis, you can see the wavelengths that are being absorbed. And we can see that the quantum yield is approximately 0 0.1, with a slight drop in the middle due to the lower efficiency of transfer from the carotenoid pigments. And then in the far red area above 680, we can see that the quantum yield drops very rapidly. This is an indication that with only far red light, photosynthesis is not fully effective and requires the absorption of light in another region that we'll talk about in a moment. This is an in indication that the photosynthesis or production of oxygen, it is dependent on two photosystems that operate in series. Another puzzling 
effect was this plot here known as Emerson's enhancement effect discovered by the scientist Emerson. Here he's shown a red light on chlorella and looked at the relative rate of photosynthesis and it increased. And then once the light was turned off, it went back down to zero. He then turned on a red light and got the same amount of photosynthesis as the far red light. Then he turned both lights on, both the far red and the red light. And instead of getting double the amount, he got some synergistic effect that was more than the sum of the two. This puzzled scientists for quite a number of years until it was realized that there were two photosystems in play here interacting with each other. These two systems of photosynthesis are known as photosystem one and photosystem two. Photosystem one preferentially absorbs far red light of the wavelengths greater than 680 nanometers, whereas photosystem two preferentially absorbs red light of 680 nanometers and is driven very poorly by far red light. This figure here is known as a Z scheme of photosynthesis. And on the Y axis here, we can see what is known as the redox potential of the molecules that are shown in this Z scheme, with the reactions being more oxidizing on the lower end and more reducing on the high end. So of lower energy going to a higher energy state. So in this system, if we look on the left-hand side of photosystem two, we can see a antenna complex with a P680 molecule, which is a chlorophyll-like molecule that is capable of absorbing red light. In this process of absorbing red light, it kicks an electron up to an excited P680 state shown here with a star. Where is it getting this electron? It's getting this electron from water. So this is where water is split and oxygen is produced. That P680 with a star excited state is high in energy and can pass that electron down an electron transport chain to molecules of lower and lower energy. So it's always moving in a passive way, as we've learned before when we talked about the chemical potential, it's moving from a higher energy state to a lower energy state. And eventually, that through that electron transport chain, that electron is transferred to a P700 molecule and another antenna complex. And this P700 chlorophyll molecule can absorb far red light. And that then excites that electron, again, that was just captured, and kicks it up into an excited state of the P700 star. That electron in that P700 then is transferred to an NADP plus molecule through a reductase, which takes the oxidized form of NADP plus and captures the electron and reduces the molecule to an NADPH, a high energy rich molecule. In this figure, we can see how these antenna complexes work. We have light being absorbed by, in many wavelengths by carotenoids, a chlorophyll B molecule, a chlorophyll A molecule. These are all organized to funnel that energy by residence energy transfer to the P680 reaction center. Again, moving from higher energy wavelengths and passing them down to the lower P680 reaction center. Here's another view of that where you can see the amount of photons that are being absorbed that is captured by carotenoids can be passed to a chlorophyll B, which can be passed to a chlorophyll A, which you can then transfer it to the P680. Note that during the transfer of this energy, a little bit of the energy 
of the light is passed off as heat. Now, as I mentioned, there are these thylakoid membranes where the electron transport chain is located. In this figure, we can see a single protein molecule embedded in this thylakoid membrane. It's known as the D1 protein, which is part of the photosystem two reaction center that we'll describe in a moment. Note that a portion of the protein is on the stroma side of the thylakoid membrane, and another part of the protein is on the thylakoid lumen side of the membrane. This is very important as these thylakoid membranes are responsible for the transfer of energy across this membrane, which ultimately is going to result in the production of ATP and NADPH. As seen here in a schematic of the light reactions. Now this is a simplified version. These are complexes of proteins. There are four basic complexes here that we will describe. Each of these complexes is made up of multiple proteins that are involved in specific functions in the transfer of energy from light to chemical energy. So let's start on the left-hand side where we have photosystem two, where we can see the photosystem two complex capturing light and the P680 is then transferring that electron to a plastoquinone molecule, which is getting reduced by the electron. So the PQ is going to a PQH2. Along with that is the capture of a proton from the stroma side. This is very important for energy production, as you'll see in a moment. On the lumen side, we have the splitting of water, which is resulting in the production of oxygen and more hydrogen ions, again on the lumen side. Now that proton that was on the stroma side, as it's being captured by the plastoquinone molecule, it is then released on the lumen side to acidify the lumen environment, producing more protons on the lumen side versus the stroma side, which has lower proton concentrations now since some of it is being transferred by light to the lumen side. In the process of releasing that hydrogen ion, it also transfers the electron to another complex known as the cytochrome B6F complex. And this electron can then be transferred to another molecule on the lumen side known as plastocyanin. And this molecule then transfers that electron to the photosystem one complex where another photon of light, another quantum of light is being absorbed by the P700 molecule. This excited electron from photosystem one is then transferred to a ferredoxin molecule in close association with a flavoprotein ferredoxin NADP plus reductase or FNR here. And it is this molecule with this electron that reduces NADP plus plus a hydrogen ion to form the reduced form, the energetic form NADPH in the stroma side of the chloroplast. Now there's one other molecule to look at, and that is the ATP synthase. ATP synthase can be driven by the proton gradient. As we talked about in the past, we talked about the proton pumps or the proton ATPases, which were proteins that transported protons across the membrane, creating a proton gradient. This is a ATPase synthase, which is operating in a reverse direction. It's utilizing the proton gradient produced by the electron transport chain here to move the hydrogen ion concentrations across the ATPase to the lower proton concentration. As a result of this ATP synthase, ADP plus plus inorganic phosphate are combined 
to form ATP, a very energy-rich molecule, again on the stroma side. So the proton gradient is driving the synthesis of ATP. And on the right-hand side here, we can again see the electrochemical potential gradient, which is going from high to low under lighted conditions when the sun is shining in the chloroplast. The lumen has a high electrochemical potential and the stroma has a low. And so the protons move down this electrochemical potential gradient passively. So the protons move passively down this electrochemical potential gradient. But it's all driven by light. So that is a simplistic presentation of the light reactions of photosynthesis. If we look at the chloroplasts in more detail, and particularly the thylakoid membranes, we can see that these four major protein complexes are organized in the gronal stacks here. So in the bottom left, we can see for this cartoon the different structural identities. So we have the light harvesting complex one as a dimer. We have the light harvesting complex two as a trimer. We have photosystem two cytochrome B6 F dimer, photosystem one, and the ATP synthase. Note that we have a little bit of division of labor here, and we can see that the light harvesting complex two trimer is surrounding the photosystem two complexes in the grana stack area. And it is in the outer parts of the thylakoid membranes, the stroma lamellae, where we can find the light harvesting complex one dimer associated with photosystem one. So there is a little bit of a division or separation of these molecular structures that are organized in a way to most efficiently transfer energy. In addition, you can see the cytochrome B6F dimer is strategically placed between these for the transfer of electrons. Also note that the ATP synthases are on the exterior edges of the thylakoid membranes. Understanding these light reactions has given us an idea of how some herbicides are working. In particular, we're going to be talking about two of these where DCMU or dichlorophenol dimethylurea, known also as diuron, is a molecule that interferes with the transfer of electrons in the plastoquinone complex, interrupting the transfer of energy from the P680 molecule that's excited to the P70 molecule. And paraquat, a herbicide known as methyl viologen, also interrupts in the electron transport chain by interrupting the transfer of the electron energy to NADP+. So no NADPH is produced. In both cases, the herbicides are blocking the transfer of energy through the electron transport chain, resulting in the loss of energy. Paraquat results in the production of a large amount of superoxide molecules that burn up the leaf. So important discovery about photosynthesis was that ATP could be synthesized without light. And this is a demonstration of how one can do that. So this is also a principle of the chemiosmotic theory that was formulated by Peter Mitchell in the 1960s, for which he won the Nobel Prize. If we take a bunch of isolated chloroplasts with just the thylakoids and pour them into a buffered medium in this flask at a pH of four, and we allow it to equilibrate to the pH of four, then we'll have the pH four medium inside of the thylakoid lumen to be at pH four. 
we can then transfer those thylakoid membranes to another beaker with pH of eight. So now we have the outer side of the thylakoids, which would represent the stroma at a pH of eight or much lower hydrogen ion concentrations than the lumen, which is now full of pH four or higher hydrogen ion concentrations. If we then drop some ADP and inorganic phosphate into that beaker in the dark, we'll get the synthesis of ATP without light. And this is the result of that electrochemical potential gradient between the lumen side and the stroma side, passing protons through the ATP synthase to synthesize ATP from ADP and PI. Pretty cool. So there's a number of similarities between the electron transport in higher plants on the thylakoid membranes in the chloroplasts and purple bacteria. Purple bacteria also have an electron transport chain where light is absorbed by a reaction center and the electrons are transported by cytochrome C to a cytochrome BC1 complex. Protons are formed on one side of the membrane and an ATP synthase utilizes those protons to make ATP. So this is occurring in a purple bacteria, not in the chloroplasts of plants. And mitochondria, another organelle within the cell, in plant cells as well as human cells, also has an electron transport chain where we have a matrix on one side and intermembrane space on the other side of the membrane. And we have a protein embedded in that membrane known as NADH dehydrogenase, which will utilize or take energy and electrons from an NADH molecule, oxidizing it to NAD+. This is different from NADP+, but similar molecule. And that NAD dehydrogenase then passes that electron to a molecule known as Q, but also produces a proton on the intermembrane space, as does the Q when it transfers its electron to the cytochrome BC1 complex. The cytochrome BC1 complex then transports that electron to cytochrome C to a cytochrome oxidase, which also produces a proton converting oxygen to water. And again, an ATP synthase in the mitochondria then utilize that proton gradient to synthesize ATP from ADP plus inorganic phosphate. So all three systems are very similar in the process of producing ATP. So one of the problems with light is you can't turn it off. You can't turn the sun off. And unless that electron transport chain is always transporting electrons to some sort of molecule at the end, in this case, NADP plus to capture it into NADPH, if you somehow stop that system, you get a buildup of high intensity photo damage. That's the result of high light. So let's look at the top of this figure here for a moment. We have photons and some of that photons are being captured and used for photosynthesis. Then we have an extra amount of photons that are being captured that are still bombarding those chlorophyll molecules without being able to release it to the P680 reaction center. And as a result, it needs to do something with this energy or it's going to burn up. So the first line of defense is to release those energies as heat, as we discussed before. And this is a major way of releasing that excess energy. On the other hand, there are a number of toxic photoproducts that are also produced by 
these excess photons, resulting in what is called the triplet state of chlorophyll, or superoxide, or singlet oxygen, or hydrogen peroxide, or hydroxy radicals. These are all highly oxidative that are known as reactive oxygen species. And these are produced very rapidly and quite extensively. And plants have coped with this by a second line of defense, a, a defense system of scavenging these free radicals. Carotenoids are very important in this process of absorbing excess light energy and releasing that as heat. But there are also other systems that reduce the free radicals. And involved with that are superoxide dismutase and ascorbate, or vitamin C as we know it. With those scavenging systems, you can protect the damage by these free radicals. However, ultimately, scavenging can only do so much. And occasionally, under particular conditions, such as drought or high light intensity, there can be damage to the photosynthesis system. And the first point of damage is the D1 proteins in photosystem 2. When this is knocked out, then there can be no transfer of electron energy through the electron transport chain. And the only way to deal with this damaged D1 protein is to remove it from the complex and put a new protein back in place. And the result of this oxidized D1, you have what is called photo inhibition. And energy cannot be captured by the plant leaf. Ultimately, the leaf will either burn up or starve to death. So the other process that I want to describe is the non-photochemical quenching by the carotenoids. So we have three molecules here, viola xanthin, the anthera-xanthin, and the zeaxanthin. And in this process with NADPH and ascorbate, they can take light energy and absorb it to reduce the amount of potential damage to the plant. So carotenoids are essential. If you've ever taken a plant and put it from the inside of your house to the outdoors and you see the leaves burn up, this is because the plant under low conditions has not produced any carotenoids because it hasn't needed them. These carotenoids act like sunscreen as we use for our bodies to protect us from the sun and protect against sunburn. These carotenoids need time to be synthesized and the plant has to be gradually exposed to higher light intensities so as it doesn't burn up, but is allowed to build up enough carotenoids, enough sunscreen protection pigments to protect the plant from sunburn. So in summary, in phase one of photosynthesis, the light reactions, light is captured by photosynthetic pigments, mostly chlorophyll. This light energy, is transferred to the electron transport chain in the thylakoid membranes of the chloroplast where it is converted to chemical energy. In particular, the energy-rich compounds ATP and NADPH. In the next lecture on the carbon reactions, we will learn how ATP and NADPH take their energies and transfer it to carbohydrates which we then eat as food to produce our own energy in our mitochondria. Well, that's it. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you like this video, then please like it on my YouTube channel, where you'll find more interesting videos on plant physiology, on grapes, on viticulture and winemaking practices. I encourage you to subscribe to my YouTube channel, where you'll get more of these videos as I keep releasing new videos all the time. Have a great day.